The following is a paid program for Rental Housing Network. Good afternoon. I'm Sandy Adams, and this is the Rental Housing Network Show. Rental Housing Network is a member-based information center that provides rental owners, realtors, managers with the resources they need to properly manage their rental properties, such as forms, informational guides, access to credit reports, operational advice, and lots of classes and events. For a list of what Rental Housing Network has to offer, visit our website at rentalhousingnetwork.com. Today, I have in the studio with me my guest, Myron von Reichfeld. Uh, he is president of the Santa Clara County Association of Realtors. So welcome to the show. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, we were just talking, you know, I got my license, salesperson's license in 1978, and then went on to get my brokers in 85. And you were saying that you started in 84? 84. I got my license in 1984 and uh, never looked back really since then. Well, there's been a lot of changes in the industry since then, and maybe you can talk about that a little bit. Well, it, there there really has. It's uh, We've gone from uh, when I first started uh, and bought my very first house, which was I was actually my first client. <laughs> and, oh. uh, and doing that, we worked on the 8.5 by 11, two sheets of paper, wrote it all out, and the deal was done in about 30 or 40 days to where we now have contracts that are, you know, 15, 20 pages long uh, with lots and lots of uh, important information that's uh, necessary and required to protect both consumers and the brokers out there. Lots of disclosures. Uh, lots of disclosures. Uh, when in doubt, tell them. That's what I tell my clients every time. If, if you got to ask me if you should say something about it, then you should say something about it. And not only that, but when I started, we had a book that was issued every week that had all the listings in it. Yeah. And we had to work off that book. And of course, sometimes properties were sold, you know, before we even knew about it. And then we progressed to getting this rolled paper printout of listings that were all coded. Yeah, know? that little heat thermal thing. That yeah. Was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that was pretty exciting when we got to that point where we could print them out and, and actually have some kind of listing and it came out on a roll of paper. You yeah. Know? And uh, so today, with the technology that we have, it's it's almost hard to keep up with the changes in the technology. It it really is. It's well, it's, it, it, keeping up with it is certainly one aspect of it. But the other exciting part of it, it has really brought information to our clients so much faster uh, that it allows them to really experience the real estate uh, uh, market in a much different way than they ever have before. So our, I'm finding that our clients today are uh, far more informed as far as what's out there, what what they're looking for. Uh, and oftentimes, many times, they come to me and say, here, we found our house. Just tell us what we need to do from that point on. And so uh, from that perspective, it's made our career and our jobs a little bit easier, and a little bit different. In other ways, it's made it a lot more competitive and a lot more difficult. So it kind of has those those balances between it. Um, yeah, now that you mentioned that, when yes, when we started, we weren't allowed to share the uh, the listing. We weren't allowed to give the client a copy of the listing that was, you know, like privileged information, yes. you know. And now they can go online and and find it first. Yeah. So they find sometimes they find stuff we don't even know about. It's uh, it's uh, it's really interesting how, how all the different sources. Sometimes it's not accurate information they find and they call us and we say, "Well, that listing sold two years ago. Sorry, sorry, it's still out there somewhere in the in the internet space. But uh, we get that with rentals. Yeah. You oh, know, rentals people, all the time. Yeah. People calling. Well, someone's been living there for the last three months. Yeah. Uh, no, it's not available. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. So yeah, uh, but it has been helpful. You know that people can go look and kind of get an idea of neighborhoods and that kind of thing before they even. Uh, start looking for a realtor. Yeah, even even the aspect of uh, of Google Maps and stuff. People can now explore uh, neighborhoods that uh, you know before in the past we'd have somebody moving from you know Texas or someplace to here or vice versa, and they'd have no idea where they're going. Whereas now I'm finding that our clients when they come they they have a real good idea of what's the what's in the area, what's around it, and it's you know they simply can log online and pull up a map and and they can look at it from space, they can look at it from the streets, they can drive down the streets virtually. Uh, looking at so from that perspective, it really does provide a, a unique opportunity that uh, that 30 years ago I would have never ever envisioned would have been a possibility. Well, that really is, has come a long ways from having your client flipping through the locate or the Thomas Guide, yeah, you know, to, to, to navigate you. Now to, we're dating ourselves. Yeah, yeah, we really are because uh, yeah, GPS is 
has must have really helped the real estate industry. Oh yeah, GPS, even uh, you know some of the other neat things out there. Just cell phones. I remember when cell phones first started, and the guy came into the office. That was about nineteen. Gosh, might have been eighty. 485, right, right, right around when I was starting. And I think I still had a pager then. Yeah, 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 had pagers were big. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, wanted to sell me, it was like $3,000. I go, are you kidding me? I can't afford $3,000. And and now you look at it today, everybody has it. We couldn't live our, we couldn't do our businesses without the cell phones and stuff that we have today. So. Yeah, now you can go get a nice one for $99. Yeah. So. <laughs> now, in the current market or the, uh, the re- most recent years, we've seen a big influx of investors in the market. Are you seeing that a oh. lot of a lot of foreign investors, a lot of cash investors? Yes, we are. Um, and you, you, cash is certainly a very large aspect to our marketplace right now. I think as investors are looking for places to uh, get a decent return on their on their money, which is what investors generally try to find, uh, the the normal ways in which they would do it before aren't really working so well. Uh, they work for some, but not for many. And and so when you see the uh, influx of these people coming into our marketplace, I, I always look back and say, why? Why do we have so many people coming in today? You know, when roughly about 30 to 35 percent of our transactions today are all cash buyers. And that really is really significantly different than what it was just eight years ago when we saw the big rush and the and the purchases that we're seeing were 80, 90 uh, or 100 percent type financing programs, which is sort mm-hmm. of what kind of led to our, our uh, was certainly a key factor in the down in the downturn. And the fundamental difference today is is we have people are putting more money down, and, and when they're not all cash, they're certainly putting significant amounts of money down. So it does. I think a lot of uh, first time buyers, or or even you know your regular mom and pop, or couples, or young professionals that normally you know uh, aspire to buy a home, have lost a, a little bit of faith in the market. But obviously, investors haven't. And they still think it's a real good investment to get their money into real estate here. Well, and, and I, what I see is I see a lot of the foreign money, a lot of money from other areas other than even from within the United States. Well, there is a certain significant amount that's coming from within. There's a lot coming from on the outside. And mm-hmm. so uh, to me, that's kind of interesting that you're seeing the uh, other national national companies coming or national countries coming in and uh, infusing cash into our real estate as opposed to into other investment vehicles. And so you kind of look at that and you ask yourself, why? Why is it that they're doing that? And I think that the end result is is that they see that uh, in, a, in a time when inflation will likely kick back into our economy at some point in the future, and people are saying that it is going to come, there will be some inflation and at that point, that real estate has tended to be over time a terrific hedge against inflation. So it's a great place to put some of your uh, investment dollars uh, to protect against some of the inevitable rise and, and the devaluing of our dollars as that moves forward. Well, even when we had the decline, I, you know, I, I feel that um, real estate is cyclical and that, you know, where we don't normally see a decline like we just recently did, but it still comes back, and especially in this valley, you know, so we're still going to see a rebound. Um, even if the vi- if, Even if the prices decline, you just hang in there and you'll see it appreciate again. That's how I feel about it. Do oh, I, you agree? I, I agree 100%. Uh, real estate, if you understand it as what it is, as an investment vehicle, it does have cycles, just like other things. Stock market goes through cycles. You, just anything that you're going to think about that from an investment perspective has a certain amount of risk to it. Uh, but it also has the benefits of the gains. And if you understand that uh, over time, it will inevitably work out because real estate, in one of the vehicles and one of the reasons it does that is because it's so closely affected by inflation. So if we believe that 10 years from now a loaf of bread is going to cost us more money than it does today, then real estate is a great place to put money because if if bread's going to cost more money, so is the cost of housing, so is the cost of clothing. And so looking for vehicles where you can put money into where they're going to stay at pace with that, that makes sense. Whereas in the stock market, you can put money in Intel and it may be a really great stock today or some, but you can put money in a, in a specific stock vehicle and it may or may not be here 10 years from now, but right. the real estate will be. And a place for someone to live is certainly going to be a necessary part. And so that's one of the reasons why I believe real estate is a fantastic vehicle for investors and, and they know it. Um, because it will be here long term, whereas a company can come and go, their their stock value can rise or fall, but the house is going to be here. 
your tenants are going to be there. If you're renting it, um, if it's a place for you to live, you got to have a place to live. So uh, it makes sense that that's the place where a lot of people are. You're seeing a lot of money being infused into our real estate economy. Well, we know that there's an influx of investors. And one thing that Larry Stone mentioned when I talked to him was that, you know, investors that are, are in it for a specific time frame normally. You know, they they put their money into something and then at some point they're going to take it out, whether it's going to be 5, 10, 20 years down the line. But they probably have some kind of plan. Um, and that can also affect the market if it goes the other way, right. you know, if the investors decide to take their money out of the market. Now, non-owner occupied purchasing now, that puts more properties into the rental market. And so how do you think that's going to affect the sales market? Well, the sales market, I think, is affected more by a lot of other factors other than the, the rental per se. The rental market itself is one of those things where Again, like we're seeing right now, rates are going up significantly or quite a bit uh, from a rental perspective right now. And we just saw over the last two years a significant jump in in what it costs just for a two-bedroom, one-bath apartment. I think that that's going to uh, continue to some extent mostly because rental properties like a home that you're going to live in is really subject to an inflationary pressures. And as you see, and that and inflationary pressures are also an indication of that is supply and demand. So right now, if you look at our inventory levels from a resale market, we don't have a tremendously great supply of properties, but we have a very large supply of buyers who are trying to purchase at this point in time. There is a time, I don't know when it's going to hit, but that will change. And that will that's what kind of gives us our cycles of, of ebbing and flowing, so to speak, where the market's up a little bit now, it might be down a little bit a little bit later. But uh, the trend over time is up, and I think that that's going to continue. I don't see uh, – it, again, you can even look back over – take any kind of 10-year period of time, including the 10 years where we just had one of the largest down, downward trends that we've ever seen. And if you look at it from a longer-term investment perspective, real estate 10 years ago, you would have paid less for it 10 years ago than you're paying for it today. I'm going to have to cut you off right there because sure. we're going to take a short break, but we'll be right back with uh, Myron von Reisfeld. Uh, with SCORE. You've heard that becoming a landlord just got easier with Rental Housing Network, the resource center for rental owners and property managers. Get the latest industry updates, access online forms, notices, run credit reports, and take classes to stay current on rental responsibilities. Even list your properties online for free. Come to their networking night to meet other property managers, also roofers to clean up companies every second Tuesday of the month. Go to rentalhousingnetwork.com. That's rentalhousingnetwork.com. The best way to protect your housing investments. Welcome back. This is the Rental Housing Network show, and I am talking with Myron von Richfeld, who is president of the Santa Clara County Association of Realtors. And we're talking about um, properties and the influx of investors uh, buying most recently. Um, now, do you think with uh, there being more rentals, are, are we seeing realtors turning towards management more? Yeah, you, you, there is definitely a trend where you're seeing that. And, and the one thing I'll tell you about realtors in general, we're very entrepreneurial in spirit. And when there's a need, uh, especially dealing with any form of housing, uh, we're not short of people trying to fill those needs. And when you see the influx that we're seeing right now of, of investors that, need, that have a certain need for uh, people to help manage and run those properties – uh, there's many bright minds that are trying to find the the next way to help that and help their clients and, and to really uh, work with them on a long-term basis. One of the uh, unique aspects to property management is that it kind of gives you a client that is a long-term client. So uh, while you they may not be selling their house right now or their property right now, uh, at some point in the future, as it, as with most investments, they look to trade them up or move them over and and, uh, and when that happens and you're managing them, you're kind of first in line. And that helps you uh, establish that relationship with your client for a long period of time. Well, I know that's why a lot of realtors do it is so that they can maintain that relationship. And it is very different because if you only sell, then you have a relationship with that client for 90, maybe 120 days by the yes. time you find the property and, and go through escrow. And then you're done. Where... As a property manager, I have clients for 10, 15, 20 years. And so it's an ongoing relationship that we have for for many years. Yes. And uh, while, while I don't 
talk to them frequently, it's still a relationship. I mean, there's still a contact and they're, you know, still getting money from me and statements and, you know, and when there's something wrong, you know, they hear from me and, and uh, they usually don't like hearing from me (laughs) because they know there's something wrong. But in that relationship, of course, we are concerned about realtors getting the education that we need or that they need to be good property managers. You know, we're not opposed to realtors wanting to keep that contact with their clients and manage their property for them. And really, property management is a good bread and butter type of um, income because it's it's steady. You get paid every month, you know, and it's unlike commissions where you may have a, get a lot of money in one month and not get any money for the next three, you know. So, it, so it's been good for me. And... Uh, and that's why I got into it back in 1986 is because um, it is a nice, steady income. Uh, but, of course, you have to know what you're doing. I didn't know what I was doing when I first started. And, and gosh, I'm much better today than <laughs> it was 20-some <laughs> years ago. But I know that uh, because more pr- realtors are getting into property management, you know, uh, the Rental Housing Network is very concerned with them getting more and more education. And CAR has started some education in the last couple of years. And, um, you know, do you think that they're going to continue to increase the education for property managers? Um, I do. I know it's. I know at the Santa Clara County Association of Realtors, we do uh, provide uh, quite a few uh, classes on uh, management and getting into management and even for experienced managers to continually kind of stay sharp. Uh, that is the one uh, aspect of property management that is a little scary sometimes because a lot of people think that, oh, well, how hard can it be? You know, you you just go out there and start doing it and, and start taking the money and doing whatever else. But but there are so many rules and so many requirements for a property manager in order to do it correctly. Uh, you're dealing with other people's money, which the Bureau of Real Estate takes very seriously. And if you're not doing it correctly, then you have uh, a real significant problem on your hands that that uh, may come back to bite you. So, well, if you're going to manage for several clients, um, you know, if you have one or two, you can just set up separate bank accounts. And and um, as you know, Rural Housing Network has brought some classes into SCORE this year. We brought in the mold class earlier this year, yes, and uh-huh. then the trust account class. But if you're going to manage for a number of clients, then you have to have a trust account that meets BRE regulations. And not as many realtors have had trust accounts, I don't think, in the last few years, because now that money just goes straight to an escrow company, right? Right, yeah. Title company that, yeah. that has their own trust account. And they haven't had to worry about that. But but with property management, you do have to have a trust account that meets BRE regulations. Absolutely. And, and that's probably where a lot of people might get themselves into trouble if they're not really familiar with uh, what's really necessary and what you have to do. So... Uh, the takeaway on that would be uh, if you want to get into property management or you're doing property management, uh, spend the time and the money to make sure and go to the classes like the trusted class that's that's going to be at SCORE even this afternoon. Or I probably shouldn't say this afternoon, huh? <laughs> uh, but, uh, but the, that we just had. Yeah, that we just had. So we, we have the trust accounts uh, or we have trust account classes and other things like that that I would highly recommend. Uh, whether you go through Santa Clara County Association of Realtors or through other uh, uh, Tri County and California Apartment Association, uh, those all have are great resources to go out and educate yourself uh, to prevent yourself from doing the common mistakes that might really come back and hurt you or you might regret later. So, uh, education is really key. Uh, stay on top of that. And the other side of it, I would say, is a network—a network of other managers. Uh, as managers, we deal with and we talk with one another. We find out and we see trends. We find out what's going on and what's happening. And that helps us. That helps us all be a little bit better and kind of be prepared for some of the things that are that are happening out there to help us all as property managers. Well, you know, we have mixers every month. Rental Housing Network has a mixer every month. And property managers come. Our owners come. And we have vendors who come. And we just kind of throw it out there to, you know, let them ask questions of, of maybe a situation that they're dealing with now and they don't know how to deal with it. And so everybody gets an education because uh, whoever has the question, many times it's an owner um, who's managing their own property. And then they get to hear the different answers from the different property managers and how they would handle that situation. And so I think that they can learn more from our mixers sometimes than than the classes that we put on every month uh, because this is a specific situation that someone is actually dealing with and how do I handle it, you know. And um, there's so many different scenarios that you you can't 
you know, foresee them all. Yeah. But it's you need a resource to go to, and that's why we set up the Rental Housing and, Network so people could call us or email us and say, you know, my tenant is doing this, or I want to do this, uh, give a notice, or, and you know, how do I do that, or what do I do, and uh, so we can give them some guidance to make sure that they properly follow through with whatever they're trying to do. Yeah, and I, and then those are valuable resources for uh, for both owners and for uh, practitioners to really get out there and, and network and communicate and really establish relationships in places where, because we don't all know all the answers, but, but most of us know lots of people. And through those, through those connections and those relationships, uh, we can definitely find the answers. And as long as we do that and we work hard at that, and that's part of what it takes in this, in this business is you got to work at it every day. It's not one of those things where, you know, both you and I, we got our licenses a long time ago, but but we didn't stop educating ourselves once we got our license. It's an ongoing process. We still that. strive to better ourselves and, and be more knowledgeable because no one person knows it all. And and uh, and sometimes you forget. You know, I've written an, I just written a, wrote an article recently saying, you know, just because you took a class on this once before doesn't mean you don't need to take a class on it again right. because how much of it do you remember? Well, and what's changed? You know, exactly. You know, the, our laws are constantly changing. We're... That's another thing that organized real estate does and the association does really well is we're very up on uh, what's happening uh, that to uh, with laws and bills that are going through this, both the state and national levels uh, that will affect property owners and property rights. And we are an advocate for those things for uh, that affect real estate, uh, even for people that we may never know or never meet. And uh, but it's important because uh, your property values and your property rights are an important thing for us to to work hard to maintain and to establish and maintain the values that uh, that people are investing in, so that their their investment is worth something 20, 30, 40 years from now. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears here because I know you wanted to talk about legislation a little bit, and so we will go there. Okay. And um, every year there are bills in the legislature that they're. Uh, proposed bills that they're considering that affect our industry. We watch those. We, you know, we, of course, we lobby for our organization. One of the bills I know that we wanted to talk about was the split role on the 1030, um, 1031 exchanges. Yes, yeah, or, so, or yeah. Well, the, well, we have two split role, which is a, which is basically taking our prop thirteen. Prop, prop thirteen. Thank yes, you. And uh, and basically cutting it in half or starting to dissect it and. And and I and I certainly understand the challenges that the state has and the federal government has. We, uh, you know, there's a they need a lot of money to continue doing all the things that they do, and and unfortunately, when there's not enough money coming in for them to cover it, they're looking for other places and other ways to do that. And oftentimes, legislators kind of get uh, sidetracked by looking at the easy way as opposed to doing the harder things. Well, let me play devil's advocate here because I I get why. They are looking at this because, you know, when, when Prop 13 was passed, it was, you know, the the idea behind it was to protect the retiree or the um, as you get older you so that you know what your bill is going to be, you know. And so it's, you know, it's got its limits of how much it can go up. And so, um, you know, 20, 30 years, you're in the same house now it's paid off and you can rely on that tax bill and i that was supposed to be the idea behind it but also when that happened the commercial properties uh retail um properties uh, they all fell under prop 13 too correct yes. uh-huh. and so therefore it limited their tax bills and now they're saying well you know we did it for you know uh for individuals buying you know we want to to lock in their their bill and not so much the commercial. Right. So let, let's look at that because, you know, 80% of the marketplace in the commercial world is small businesses. They're, they're small people like you and me running our businesses out of a small uh, building that's owned by some guy who has maybe owns two or three buildings but doesn't own millions. He's not an Intel or a Google or a Yahoo. And, and in regards to that, uh, when property taxes get changed, my triple net lease, which is what most leases are and p- people that do business like us have, uh, my income, my, my expenses go up significantly as a result of that. So so Prop 13 helps a lot of people, especially small businesses, as a result of, for especially for when they're leasing from someone that's had a property for a period of time, uh, in helping keep those triple net charges down. 
and and helping them establish and, and afford a reasonable rent rate. Um, if we start paying more, it's going to be very difficult for us to do that. Not only that, but those costs do get passed on somewhere. They do. And and the other side of it is 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 rental housing for units. Uh, the apartment buildings are considered commercial property. If you take those out from underneath that veil, the rents for those people are is going to go up significantly because the investors who have that are going to pass those costs on to their tenants. Okay. Well, I'm going to have to cut you off right there. Uh, but it's been a great conversation. Uh, you won't want to miss our upcoming shows next week. I ha- My guest will be Mayor of Milpitas, um, Jose Estevez. I'm looking forward to him coming in. Um, if you miss a show, you can catch us on YouTube or on our website in the Media Gallery at rentalhousingnetwork.com. That's rentalhousingnetwork.com. Thanks for being with us, and don't forget to like us on Facebook. The preceding has been a paid program for Rental Housing Network.